Anyway, exposure to heat, right? So hyperthermia, it just definition, probably not necessary to remember this. Everybody knows what it means to be too hot. Right? So but inability to eliminate heat. Uh, three things, heat cramps, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, and that's what we're gonna go through. Heat cramps is not really a medical emergency, okay? You will get calls on heat cramps, people cramp up. Uh, they're out there, they're exercising, they're going to two a days, they're, you know, playing golf at uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, three o'clock in the afternoon on August day, it gets hot, okay? There's nobody else playing golf at that time, so the course is empty, so it's good, but it's hot. That was my summer. Okay, so the, uh, anyhow, so you get these heat, heat cramps, you start to spasm. If, if you've been outside at all, if you haven't had heat cramps, you probably need to get outside more. Be a little bit more active, okay? Most everybody has had heat cramps. You start getting these little muscle spasms. Uh, can't be, they might not be big. They might just be a little arm spasm or something in the arm or you get cramps or you get sort of nauseated, right? You get too hot right? uh, and you start cramping. It is an electrolyte imbalance. It's very easy to fix. Gatorade is making millions of dollars fixing this. Uh, you go in, you had that hot, hot, sweaty day, 18 holes of golf, 100 plus degrees. You feel good, you're nice and warm, you're not all bound up, and, but uh, you need Gatorade. You need electrolyte replacement with water. It usually it's a three to one. Okay, and patients, the reason I tell you this, the patient needs to know this. They need to drink, if they drink 20 ounces of Gatorade or uh, electrolyte solution, I just buy the little stuff at Walmart in the uh, little little uh, envelope type stuff. Here, put it in water, shake it up. up. And uh, if you drink a Gatorade, 20 ounces of Gatorade, you need 60 ounces of water to offset the sugar. So you should drink 60 ounces of water, then 20 ounces of Gatorade. But anyway, they do need that. You get the electrolytes balanced out, and the twitches go away, the cramps go away, the nausea goes away, uh, and you're good. Okay? You can continue on with your day if you got these heat cramps. Uh, EMS-wise, get them out of the hot environment, just like any of these emergencies we're talking about. Get them out of the hot environment, loosen up the clothing, uh, cool them off passively with water and fans, air conditioners, right? This, if they're not nauseated, they can take some Gatorade and start sipping on this. Usually when you tell them that they have heat cramps, uh, they won't want to spend that couple thousand dollars to, for that ride to the hospital. They could need IV therapy, but Probably not, not with heat cramps, okay? It's, it's just a simple medical emergency to fix. Uh, I've noticed a lot of cramps in, in, or muscle spasms in the forearms. That's where I get them most of the time. I, my forearms start to tighten up, they twitch a little bit, and they sort of lock up, and go, you know? But, and then that's the reason I need to know, uh, I need Gatorade. I have a different, of course, I sweat like a pig, but the, uh, during tape ball, you've probably seen that. But the, usually, when my hat, my when I'm out playing golf or whatever, my hat gets completely saturated with sweat. The whole thing's wet. And I know when my hat's wet, completely wet, I need to drink some Gatorade. That's sort of my deal there. But uh, a lot of times, patients don't really know this. That's why they need to be educated on, on heat cramps, okay? Now, heat exhaustion is a difference. Now, back up to this. These guys are going to be sweaty, okay? They're going to hot to the touch of the skin. Sweaty, hot to the touch, feeling feeling bad, nauseated, sort of feeling rough, okay? But no big deal. So, still sweating. That's very important. Heat exhaustion. These guys are going to be profusely sweating, like just pouring sweat. Their skin, however, this is the telltale sign. When you walk up to them, their skin is going to be 
What would you anticipate their skin being if they're sweating really bad? They've been outside working all day or whatever. You'd think it would be hot, but it's not. Yeah, it's going to be cold and clammy. So when you touch them, they're going to be cold and clammy. Okay? They still could. Now, these don't go in order. You don't get heat, heat cramps, heat exhaustion, heat stroke. Okay? They can come in any form. Uh, but anyway, salt and water loss, they do need electrolytes. These guys here with true heat exhaustion probably need uh, IV therapy. They need to go to the hospital, get a couple bags run through them, okay? Balance their electrolytes somewhat. Look at that. Uh, they, can, they can stay at home and rehydrate themselves. They're just gonna feel bad a lot longer. So if you get heat exhaustion, if you don't get IV therapy, you, you can regulate your fluids back it's just going to take longer, okay? And, and you're going to feel bad. Uh, this person here that's hot, really profuse sweating, and uh, cold, clammy skin, they probably need to go to the hospital at least get a couple bags of IV fluid, unless you have those stashed somewhere at your house. Uh, this person here is does not go back to the uh, work. They're done. They're done for a couple of days. Get heat exhaustion. The heat cramp person can go back playing golf. This person here, oh no. They need to sit inside, cool down, continue to rehydrate for at least a, a couple, three days. Uh, they shouldn't go back out to the heat. They go back out to the heat, they're more susceptible to having the heat exhaustion again. So that's something really important to educate them on. Hey, you can't go back out to the heat. That's the thing with like two days and the football stuff, and they get into that, and the military's the same way. They don't really care. They think water's for weak, is weakness. But the, uh, uh, they want to put you back out into the environment when you shouldn't really go out back out to the environment. You need to stay and cool down. Once you have a true heat emergency, to include heat exhaustion, you're more susceptible to heat emergencies for a long time. I almost, I think I was pretty close to heat stroke and uh, I couldn't go outside for, in the summertime for, for a long time, for any length of time. It took me quite a bit uh, like a month or so to readjust to get where I could stand the heat. Okay. But these guys are done. Uh, same treatment for heat exhaustion. Passively cool them off. Loosen the clothing. Okay. You can wet them passively with lukewarm water. Uh, get them wet and then fan them. Okay. Uh, they're probably going to be nauseated so the NPO you know the uh, but they do they probably do need to go get some IV fluid which we can't do right? we, you can't do so the heat exhaustion true uh, medical emergency not life-threatening okay just they just need some treatment for that it's it's not really that big of an emergency but uh, you do do need to cool them, cool them down. All right. Heat stroke, on the other hand, is life-threatening. Uh, by definition, heat stroke is when the core temperature is above 105 degrees. So this person is like cooking. Okay. Uh, the brain itself is surrounded by cerebral spinal fluid. We did a little experiment years ago. We put stick butter, which is the consistency of the brain, in water and we heated it up to 98 degrees. And guess what the butter did? No, nothing. Nothing. No, nothing. Set in the water like it belonged there. You know, it just sort of set there. Some of the oils came off of it, but it didn't, didn't do anything. We heated the water to 105, and the butter started melting. It started sloughing off the, the, the butter started getting out into the water. So you can sort of picture the brain a little bit, okay, like that. Um, it does have a, you know, they say the 20, 80% death rate 
it, it kills, it starts really damaging the brain cells. And also heat stroke is, has permanent damage, permanent uh, either short or long-term memory, memory losses you get uh, with, with heat stroke. I had a friend of mine get he, uh, diagnosed with heat stroke and he sort of had to write down stuff like what he had for breakfast stuff like last week, that day, I ate breakfast, Cheerios, because he couldn't remember at lunch what he had for breakfast, because he, he was very susceptible to heat, couldn't, couldn't get out near the heat anymore, okay, uh, it can take on a very quick uh, onset, depending on the, on the temperature, okay, uh, so, the difference here, this guy's got either very little sweating or no sweating. So he has, this patient has no way to cool his body off. So that's a problem. And so they're very hot. So when you touch them, they're very hot to the touch and they're not sweating. It's the telltale sign of heat stroke. Remember, remember those, not only for the test, but for a lot. Those are true telltale signs that someone's heat stroke. If they're not sweating, especially little kids, if they're not sweating and everybody else is sweating because it's hot, then that, that's a problem. Right. So anyway, and, and you do have to watch the little kids. Heat stroke is life-threatening. They can have seizures. They, they will be pretty close to being unconscious. They may contract. They, they draw their hands up uh, in contractures. All right. It's very hard to start an IV on someone that's like almost in rigor mortis, feels like they're all stiff and you can't bend them down. So, uh, and, and decreased level of consciousness. So it's, it's, it's life threatening. They need to be aggressively cooled off. It doesn't mean pouring cold water on them. Never pour cold or ice water on somebody trying to cool them down. You kill them, okay, possibly. So you do the same thing, you loosen their clothing up, you wet them down, get them in front of the air conditioner or the fan. They're not going to, they're going to be altered probably so nothing by mouth or at least nauseated. Then you get, uh, you aggressively cool, the, cool them off by putting cold packs in their armpits, growings, bodies. What we would do is we would take chemical coat packs around our IV uh, chambers and drip cool IV fluid in them. They get to the hospital, they'll cool them down with, with a, uh, a blanket, a bear hugger that will blow cold air on them to cool them down. Uh, to extremes, I've seen this in the desert, they uh, would take them and Get ready. They, they would be ready to resuscitate the patient, but they would dip them in ice water. And I just said don't do that, right? Mm -hmm. But these are a lot of doctors standing around telling a bunch of other people to dip, this, to dip them in ice water to cool them down before they die. Right. Then, but the doctors are there to resuscitate them, so they cool them down really quick. 29 Palms, California, that was the convict's jobs uh, they had big horse troughs, probably a little bit bigger than the table, and they had ice water at a certain temperature, and the convicts would go out there and heat that ice water, or that water at a certain temperature. You'd see them, they'd pour ice in it, stir it, measure it, and they would do that all day, out in the 130 degree desert. So the, they did it for patients with, with heat stroke, but that's, with the doctor right there. Our, our treatment, ice packs, cool them down, ban them, get them out of the hot environment, get those loose, get those clothes loose on them. When do you know that they're too cold? Right, they start to shiver, take those ice packs out, okay? They're, they're getting too cold. But in, in this would require rapid transport, probably uh, what I would do would EMT-wise, ALS backup, okay? The climate can always change things. Exercise, obviously. obviously uh, age, young age, affects heat problems. They don't really realize that 
they have drugs, obviously medications. You you go to somewhere and you're not acclimated to the environment. Uh, so when we went out to the desert, we would we would exercise some, but we were forced to drink water in a line. We drink a canteen full of water every 15 minutes and have to turn the canteen over to show that we drank our water. So in the next quart or so water, 500 milliliters of water, and turn it over. So you had to acclimate yourself to the to the climate, uh, and then exercise. Exercise is a big thing. Uh, what to say? More than a liter an hour. I can believe that. Definitely. And so uh, you have to watch people who are doing some some form of exercise or recreation in the heat as well. Okay. So always protect yourself. Always do a good physical exam. We know about humidity and the way that humidity affects the temperature. Right? More humidity, the more moisture in the air, the hotter it feels. So the heat index goes up. All right. In the desert, in Arizona, the desert of California, those places, it's dry heat over in far west Texas, far west Texas, it's dry heat. So it can be a hundred, if you left here, talk about acclimation, if you left here and you went to, let's say El Paso in the summer, it would almost feel cold in El Paso because of the dry heat. I've, I've done that before. I've left here and went over in that area and uh, it was over a hundred degrees and it felt nice outside because it was a dry heat and came from a really humid environment. So that's something to watch out for, especially yourself. Uh, working on an ambulance, you need to hydrate yourself constantly out in, uh, in the hot environment. Make sure that you stay hydrated. So just like everything else, do your good general impression, ABCs, okay? Uh, get a good sample history, move the patient to a cool environment, uh, good set of vital signs, look for the signs and symptoms. This is in your book, you, headache, weakness, dizziness, cold clammy skin, hot dry skin, right, nausea, vomiting, and, and then seizures. So there's a list of them. Uh, just remember those for heat exhaustion, Cold, clammy skin, profuse sweating, heat stroke, little or no sweating, very, very dry, hot skin. Those are the two big ones. Right. Cool place, heavy clothing, definitely get that off. Cool either passively or aggressively, it just depends on, on the situation. And then uh, burn up that air conditioner, get them out of the, the heat. If, uh, they're semi-unconscious, unconscious, left, left lateral recumbent, if they start vomiting, right? And then you probably won't give them anything to drink because you, we don't carry water on the hands. But uh, uh, I wouldn't give them anything to drink in case they start uh, vomiting anyway. Okay? Like that. Aspiration, seizures, you know, you, you have them on their back, they're not sitting up, they could aspirate. Uh, set them up, pallet position, no fluids. Okay. Everybody good with heat? Heat emergencies? They're pretty easy. Cold emergencies are pretty easy. Get them out of the environment, warm them up, cool them off, protect them, do a good assessment, determine whether you're aggressively going to warm or cool them. They're passively warm and, and slow down. Okay. Snakes. Anybody like snakes? Dead snakes. The ones I like. Okay. The uh, there's a couple of few there's a few snakes. Uh, a lot thanks to MythBusters, I found out that not every snake bite, a, like a rattlesnake bite, is they get the venom in there. Like if they go over and kill the little bunny or whatever, 
if they don't have enough venom or they may not hit the right angle to actually strike, okay? If there's two fang marks in there, we're going to go with that you have the venom, okay? You need to pre-alert the hospital that you're bringing in a rattlesnake a snake bite. Try to identify the snake or the dead snake. Bring the dead snake with you. That way, if you don't know if it's poisonous or not, <coughs> they can look that up. Don't bring the live snake, okay? Bring the dead snake. So this, the pit viper or the rattlesnake, see the way his head is shaped? And all poisonous snakes will have that sort of shape to their head. Of course, a rattlesnake warns you, right? Except for the copperhead or the water moccasin, okay? Most snakes strike out of the defense. A water moccasin or a copperhead, same sort of snake, especially the ones in Louisiana, will chase you. you be fishing on the bank, right? And uh, you say, oh, there's a snake. No problem. It's in the water where he belongs. You're, but you're in his territory or her territory. They will come up on the bank and chase you down. So you have to be aware of that, that those are sort of aggressive snakes. Uh, but this, the rattlesnake, they strike. They don't want any part of you. They're afraid of you most of the time because you're you're big, right? Okay, so, and they do have fangs. So they'll leave the fang marks, okay? This is a coral snake, nice and Colored. color there, but no fangs. What a coral snake will do, they will, a rattlesnake will come up and strike and move away. A coral snake will bite and sort of chew a little bit. So their bite pattern, you know, a rattlesnake and draw. A rattlesnake will have like two little fang marks, right? Like a coral snake will have sort of a semicircle, sort of gnawing looking. And they're both poisonous. Okay, so uh, you need to make sure that you try to identify the snake in case they need anti-venom, okay? But you also have to transport them to a hospital that has the anti-venom. Not all hospitals carry like rattlesnake anti-venom. It's expensive and they don't, a lot of them don't carry it. So if you're in a certain area, you need to make sure that uh, the, the place you're taking it to had uh, anti-venom. The, the oddest, snake bite I ever transported was a uh, black mamba. It is a deadly snake from Africa. And this person was raising them for some reason. <coughs> I didn't even know, we got the call to fly this guy to Parkland. I didn't even know what a black mamba was. And so we had to call our medical director and say, hey, what's a black mamba for one, but what is it? You know, what do we do? And he goes, nothing. Pain control, if anything, but nothing. So the guy, the patient brought a card with him to the doctor because the doctor was going to do the wrong thing at the hospital. And he had to show the doctor the card and say, hey, you don't, I need the anti-venom. Right. Short story of it is that the, when we got to the hospital, they had to go over to Dallas Zoo to get the anti-venom. For it. They knew he was coming in. We called in advance. Say, hey, you guys know what a black mama is? We're bringing that patient to you. Okay. Anyway, so there's a not as good as my pit drawing, I don't think, but there's a picture of the the rattlesnake bite. You sort of say the fang marks. Okay. And they can uh, usually have the side effects. The coral snake may it's somewhat delayed. The rattlesnake. The pot, the pit viper is almost going to start right away. Okay, like on the finger, just you know, uh, almost got stuck bit one time because I was rock climbing, mountain climbing, and I reached up over a ledge and I pulled up, and the snake was right there. Oh, and so I went, "You, you own the mountain. Move down a little bit, sort of <coughs> brush the top." <laughs> Then look over, you know, 
He, the snake went out. I, I went somewhere else. Okay, so, got to be careful where you where you walk. Okay. Uh, there it is. That if if they inject any venom, the amount of venom, where it is. Okay. Your weight, your size, your health. There's a lot of things that play a role in the the severity of the snake bites. Okay. All right. Good with snakes. So, there's only a few poisonous snakes around. The little corn snakes or rat snakes or whatever they call them, garden snakes, you know, uh, they're not going to have, their head's going to be different. They bite. They do bite. Okay? But, you know, just slap them or something. They're not going to have really any effect. They're not poisonous. Maybe just local tissue damage. Okay? So, what about the stings? The wasps, the hornets, the yellow jackets, the red, the red ones that really hurt. Bees. Uh, uh, over Thanksgiving break, there was a wasp in our house, and it it flew off. We didn't get to kill it. Anyway, I met him the next morning by the coffee pot. He was on the floor, and I was walking over to the coffee pot, and all of a sudden I felt this incredible burning, in my big toe. Like, what in the world is that? And I looked down, and there was the wasp, and he had stung me on my big toe. He died for it. He, he was crushed into many pieces for that sting, but my toe throbbed for like 30 minutes, and uh, I whimpered a little bit. No tears. Tried to get some sympathy from my wife, and there was none, but... Mm -hmm. Anyhow, so these are not going to be that serious unless you're allergic to them. If you have an anaphylactic reaction, remember that shortness of breath or, you know, dizziness, chest pain, you, you start having an uh, anaphylactic type reaction to it. It's the only time that they're really serious. Uh, so you, you guys have been stung by bees and wasps, right? The last, last time was in my forehead. <laughs> I, was almost, I was coming up out of the water in my swimming pool when, when I had it all the time. And I, I poked up and there was a bee landing on my forehead and stung me. I thought I was going to pass out. But uh, mm, no, no anaphylaxis. Just hate for bees. But temporary hate for bees. We have to have bees, right? It's been falling. Oh yeah, bees are very important to the ecosystem. Very important. Anyway, watch for the anaphylaxis with with those type of stings. Usually, soft tissue. A nine one one call for a, that unless there's a, a allergic reaction to it. What about the black widow spider? See, see the uh, hourglass on its little back there. Okay, so you have the black widow. The problem with the black widow is it does, it is, it is painful. Uh, I've never been bitten by a black widow, but it is very painful uh, bite. It can cause systemic effects. You can get abdominal cramping from it. You can get other things, other signs and symptoms that come out besides where the, where the bite is, okay? Uh, try again, same way with the snake. Try to identify what what bit the, the patient. Most of the time, they know. If it's a big black spider, then it may be a black widow. We have a lot of black widows in North Texas, okay. But it can cause uh, systemic effects, especially in the elderly, uh, where it can be fatal. Right. So uh, a spider bite, a black widow bite. You got to take with some caution, okay? Support the area that it was, uh, where the bite was. You know, do the good assessment, find out what it was, watch the airway, you know, good, uh, good supportive care. There's nothing that you can really do about that. The same way with the snake bite. This changes more than I change socks. 
But I think as right now the snake bite is the rattlesnake bite. You do nothing with it. You get as much information as you can, the time and, and everything else, and you transport the patient. There's some talk about res, uh, restrictive, you know, tourniquet bands, light tourniquets like a IV tourniquet. But most most people say, don't cut it, don't touch to suck the poison out, don't try to do ice packs or anything, just transport. Uh, everything that you do speeds up the, the venom inside, the toxin inside. Here, this black widow is the same sort of ice. If, if for some reason you do transport a spider bite, ice it, potentially splint it if it's on an arm or something, you know, but it's pretty easy to take care of. But do, do watch out for, uh, you know, the other signs and symptoms, the more serious, the abdominal pain. Muscle spasms, dizziness, headache, nausea, vomiting. You know, very rare, I think, that uh, respiratory, but possibility. Now, this guy. Oh, wait, that's oh, bro. See the fiddle on his back? Can y'all see that from there? No. You got the hourglass on the other one and the fiddle on this guy. Now the brown recluse is a lot different. This will not be painful. Most patients that have been bit by brown recluse, they don't even know it. Uh, the brown recluse is recluse. That's why it's called a recluse. It's not going to be out in the open like a, a black widow. Recluse is going to be somewhere that's moist and dark and wet, uh, like a storage room or you know, somewhere like that. A lot of people get bit when they go in their storage rooms and they start moving stuff or they go in their closet and, and start looking for things. We have a gazillion black or brown recluses in North Texas. They're all over the place. So no reason to get freaked out about them because they're everywhere, okay? But remember that by name, they're recluse. They're, so, you know, if I go over there and pull Kojak out in the summertime anyway, or you know, springtime, pull Kojak out from under the bed, I'm going to kick him a few times. You know, uh, when we lived in the country, it was a common everyday occurrence to shake the clothes out. If we had them on the floor, we'd put them back on again and take our shoes and get our shoes. Because they're, they're, they're all over the place. Right. So, uh, you don't want to get bit by a recluse. One thing they do, they, and most of the time they do require surgical repair, what they will do is they will go out and where the recluse bites the patient, they take, you see those little things they dig the green part of the strawberry out with? That little scoop looking thing? Anyway, they'll take that and they'll dig that, that sort of pussy looking, it, it's like glue out of the uh, brown recluse bite and then they'll have to pack it and give the patient antibiotics okay if that doesn't happen then the whole I mean it could it could blow up into something really bad uh, but they are recluse the bite is painless okay so a lot of times they don't know it until they get this okay and this is mild but look at look at that bite Okay, because this is what's unusual about the brown recluse. How long would it take you to call the doctor if that showed up on your skin somewhere? A good while. Really? Not long. Uh, I'd be going to the clinic. Okay. Cause oh, that's a problem. Oh, unless that's a common occurrence for you, yeah, I was like, uh, there's something wrong with me. I should go check this out. That should be a common occurrence, okay? But uh, if that that showed up and you touched it, it was sort of warm. It's like, yeah, I'm going to the doctor about that, okay? Because it could be a brown recluse. I don't know if I had no, I don't have the other one. It keeps on eating itself out. If you don't get that repair, of what they do, they take that and this part right here, they dig that out and then pack it, okay? Here, here's, here's part of the problem with the brown recluse bite. What else does that look like? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's, I 
Yeah. Really? Yeah. Sort of hypersensitive mosquitoes, but yeah. Okay. Could be a mosquito bite if you're really sensitive to it. What else do you think people get uh, mixed up with that they don't really go and get fast treatment for it? Lots. Uh, I don't know. Good. But the, the difference is, is the edema and the it, it it has a sort of a hussy top look to it. So, what do you, any guesses? This bot, some kind of bot. Let me let me just tell you, if my my when I what I get would get that confused with is a staph infection. It looks almost just like a staph infection. It, it, it is so it's termed cellulitis. It is cellulitis, inflammation of the of this tissue here. Okay, but uh, and, and it could be you people would just say, "Oh, I just, I just have cellulitis. Something bit me there." But you need to take a very close look at that. Okay, and if it doesn't heal up really quick, then I would really go to the doctor. You need to go to the doc. If it's staph, you need to go to the doctor anyway, because. Here's what the brown recluse bite, it's pretty cool sort of physiology behind it. So let's say little brown man bit here, right? <clears throat> well, what will happen is there's a little ring that forms out here. This is sort of a white, fussy looking thing, looks like a zit, you know, but it, uh, uh, it's more of a consistency of glue, down with glue. A little ring will form up here. Well, after this bot, your your antibodies are like going up there to fight it. They're like, I'm gonna kill this. Boom. Antibodies going up there to fight this. But this ring will keep the antibodies out. And as this grows, this will grow. And keep the antibodies out. That what that's why they need to dig that center core out of there. They need to take that core out of there to do that and pack it and get the patient on antibiotics. If they don't, then it'll just eat away. I have a picture somewhere of the, this guy's whole thumb is just eating away. It's necrotic. It's just all eaten up from a brown recluse bite. He didn't take care of it. So that's, that's the problem with the recluse, okay? Not necessarily an ambulance emergency, but it is something that they need to go to the doctor over. All right. What about scorpions? Don't you hate the look of scorpions? I have two here. This is our friend in Texas. <coughs> this scorpion over here is like a Arizona, California scorpion. Okay. The difference being if our Texas friend happens to bite the patient, they're going to get a lot of inflammation, a lot of pain, a lot of misery over it, okay? I mean, it'll swell up, but it's not poisonous. So it's soft tissue damage. They can put some ice on it, take some Tylenol for it, cut that to scorpion, kill all the other scorpions they see, but it's not poisonous. This guy here, they need to go to the hospital because that, po that scorpion is poisonous. It's life-threatening bite, okay? So geographically, if you were to work in a different area than the great state of Texas, you need to learn where all the bad bugs and and fish and whatever are, right? You, you would have to learn e each one that's sort of <clears throat> to that location. This guy will still bite and it will swell and it will hurt, but it, it's poisonous, so they they need to go definitely go to the hospital for that. I don't like scorpion. I just don't like the way they look. Okay. Fire ants. You can't live in North Texas without being bit by a fire ant. Okay. Uh, I didn't even know what a fire ant was until I moved down here. I'll tell you the funny story. Short funny story. I was fishing at my wife's uncle's pond. And I looked down, and uh, we we called them piss ants. 
but uh, or some people call them sugar ants or, or whatever. These little bitty ants that look like fire ants. Okay, and I was looking down there and I'm like, man, that's a bunch of fish ants. And I was still going, so I kept fishing, and they because they're harmless in Amarillo. They're just they stay away from you. They won't do anything. So I kept on fishing. All of a sudden, my feet just like, ah, what in the world? And I looked down, and these ants were biting me. I'm like, what is, what is that? And so I thought, I'll drown them. So I just stepped in the water, and they bit harder. You know? And, and so I get out, and I'm shaking them off. Then I have to go to my wife's uncle. I'm like, okay, what are those little ants? And he laughs. He, he got a, a lot of laughs out of me from the city. And he was like, those are fire ants. Or you don't know what a fire ant is? Ever seen one. In Amarillo, we had army ants. I'm sure they have a different name. But they were the red ants, big red ants. Have you seen them? They will bite you and leave a mark. It hurts really bad. Uh, we used to set them on fire as kids. But, uh, so I found out what a fire ant is. No, no problem with fire ants except if you have an anaphylactic reaction to it. We had this one lady, she was a little crazy, okay, but she decided to run away from the crazy home and uh, lay down in the street and she wouldn't get up and she was heavy. <coughs> so nobody could really get her up by herself, but she laid down in a fire ant bed. Oh my and so she's laying there, she goes, I'm not getting up. I'm like, well, I'm not helping you because I'm not getting in all those fire ants. So you can either get stung by a thousand fire ants uh, or get up one, one way or the other because I'm not getting hit by fire ants. So she finally got up. I guess she got bit enough. But you can't have an anaphylactic reaction to it. I've seen kids have anaphylactic reactions. I've treated pediatrics with anaphylactic reactions to fire ants before. Okay. You ever been having ticks on you? I think there's a picture, yeah. It's a little tick. Uh, <clears throat> I had one in my abdomen before. I can't I don't know where I picked them up, but it started itching, so I started rubbing my abdomen, and the uh, I'm like, wow, that hurt. I looked, there was a tick there. I'm like, great, I hate ticks. Uh, you just sort of squeeze them and, and remove them out, okay? Uh, and then you know, apply some Benadryl cream or whatever to there. You can get some ticks can give Lyme disease or Rocky Mountain body fever disease, but we don't necessarily have those type of ticks around here. Okay, but do keep in mind some ticks do carry more of a disease process. You know, I hate them; they're ugly looking. Uh, so on all these, okay, avoid the the snake, the the bites or the snakes or the insects. Look for clues on what it is. It is important. We we I, I forget how many times this guy got stung by bees. It was in the like the multiple ten multiple tens. He had bee stings all over him. And uh, so be careful. This safe seen is not safe. <laughs> you know, we we had to stage until they got all the bees out of the way. Until the bees went away. Because uh, if we went in there, we would have just got stung as well, right? Okay. Signs of anaphylaxis, just like we talked about, do a good, your your good assessment as always. Okay. Uh, and then, based on, you know, what what type of poison was injected, or what kind of toxin, like a wasp or bee or scorpion, who you have to know the individual ones. Eutycheria, flushing, airway obstruction, itching, just some, some general stuff. And then more serious stuff, they get into a little, they're essentially having an allergic reaction to it, okay? Keep the airway open, transport them. Could be uh, the epinephrine, if they're having an anaphylactic reaction to it, you, you might uh, use the EpiPen, request ALS. They might need, uh, if, if they go into shock, anaphylactic shock, they may need uh, 
uh, fluid re uh, resuscitation. Okay. These beans, this would be the bees. Just what it looks like. We, we always treat signs and symptoms, right? So look for, look for the signs and symptoms. When you remove the stinger, you don't squeeze it, especially on like a wasp or a bee or something, because it's like a hypodermic needle. If you take those tweezers and you, the, the stinger is still in the patient, you take that and squeeze it, you're squeezing more of the, the bee juice in or whatever it is, right? So you take like a driver's license or something and scrape, scrape it to remove it. Okay. Uh, insect bites, the spiders and the scorpions and all that, you can put ice on it, nice cold pack would do, but not, not the snake bites or the marine animals that we're about to talk to about in just a second, okay? Sometimes you do have to calm them down, okay? They get, they get excited about the, the bite because sometimes they just don't know what, what to do, right? Keep reassessing, they, things could turn quickly all right, with, with anaphylaxis. What about the uh, marine life animals? Now these are these are a lot different. Uh, remember what what was that one guy that got <laughs> killed? He got stung in the chest by the stingray. Jellyfish, right? Uh, stingray. 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 You know what? Which probably I don't know if this for sure, but you know probably what killed him. I think he removed it. It was an impaled object, and he reached up and he removed it. I don't know that for sure, but I heard that somewhere. But who knows? Uh, anyway, so the the jellyfish, uh, jellyfish, stingrays, these these different things that are down in the water in the ocean. Is it do they? Is it fresh water? Is it salt water? Uh, if your bear grills, you know bear, you know the you know who bear grills is the outdoor guy. That TV show, Running with Bear Girls? No? This, this uh, recon guy, Brit, British guy? No? No? Anyway, he said urinate on it, but he got stung by a jellyfish and he had this one woman that was with him urinate on his hand uh, to, to, do this, to keep the stinging from it. But urine doesn't work, that's a myth. I don't know why bear wanted and actually urinate. Some people say, you know, tobacco juice or they do say meat tenderizer helps with it, okay? But that's not the and this comes from the guys in Galveston, they say some meat tenderizer helps, but really with jellyfish and everything you need to irrigate the site. But it depends on which one bit you. You have to really know because some of them is it salt salt water or fresh water? Some of it you irrigate with salt water. So you have this particular jellyfish bite you, and don't quote me on this, but I think it's the box jellyfish. If it bites you, you need to irrigate it with salt water. So if it bit you in your hand, you'd stick your hand back into the ocean <laughs> and irrigate the wound. Otherwise, you'd come out and irrigate it with fresh water the, uh, with the other jellyfish. Some of them require vinegar that you pour vinegar over it and irrigate it with, and it will remove the it will help with the pain. And then don't don't remove the, we haven't went over impelled objects yet, but don't remove the, the spine, it's an impelled object. Okay, you're not really sure what you're re removing it out of, okay? So the, uh, there's a bunch of different types of jellyfish. I got stung by one on my back in uh, Cozumel, and it burned for a long time. Uh, it just turned red and it, it did stop a little bit when they got back on the ship and showered but it, it was it was very painful okay I wish I had a heat pad so you might apply heat if you have it okay vinegar so there's a lot of different things for these these marine animals it's just uh, the matter of what it is okay you know, if you're scuba diving or you're swimming over some coral reef and you get into that, 
that fire reef and you touch it, it feels like you've just been burned, okay? Um, that's one of those geographic things that you have to say, okay, what, what do we do for this? Okay. Google can help you too if you're on vacation. But if you work in that area, can you imagine working EMS like in the Grand Cayman's? That would be the job. You know, but, or be a nurse, doctor in the Cayman, Grand Cayman. They, they import everything in, into the Caymans, uh, including teachers and doctors and nurses. And so it's, it's very interesting the, the way that they do that. They don't pay very well, but they do. They import, they put you up in a house. And it's pretty neat. I was tempted. But anyway, lightning strikes, everybody good with those, those sea lot. You just have to know which particular uh, fish type bit you, okay? And like lightning strikes can be a lot of times they're fatal. Uh, you're out there playing that golf and that horn goes off, it's time to go. Remember, lightning can strike. If you don't have to have the presence of lightning, you just have to have the correct atmosphere for it, okay? So that's one thing to, to keep in mind for, for lightning strikes. It can't overwhelm the body's electrical system because look at that average of 200,000 amps. The, amp the, the amps is what actually kills the patient. When someone gets electrocuted, it's the amperage, not the voltage. I've been electrocuted by, or shocked by probably 30,000 volts before because they used to repair TVs when they were sort of big and bulky and you reach around and you touch the wrong thing with your hand and it, sh it shocks you. Fortunately, uh, very low amperage. High voltage, very low amperage. High amperage, and someone else would have been teaching you EMT school, <laughs> okay? But the, uh, so lightning is a, it's a big deal. You gotta watch out. Also, while you're out on the side of the road helping other people, lightning is a, is a problem as well. Okay, it affects the nervous system. Uh, almost, you get amnesia, weakness, pain. It goes the lightning strike. I think there's a picture coming up. It will enter one part of the body and then go to ground. So it will enter through one part and then, it, like electricity, it will go to ground, wherever the ground is. So it's almost like a gunshot wound. You're going to have an entrance wound in an exit wound, where, where the energy of the, the electricity comes out. Spinal mobilization, okay, because as the electricity goes through, all the muscles contract, okay? As it travels over the heart, it disrupts the electrical system of the heart. So do expect the patient to go into ventricular fibrillation, okay? It, it'll stop their heart uh, very quickly. So that's something that you have to keep in mind. Do a full spinal mobilization of the patient, protect their airway, watch them very close, reassess every five minutes, especially cardiac functions, okay? Uh, if, if, if they survive through it, they may, already be, they may already be in cardiac arrest, okay? So that's something to look at. And then there's just a, a flurry of signs and symptoms, okay? Uh, paralysis, business, seizures, uh, cardiac arrest, respiratory arrest, difficulty breathing, burns. So you might have a, a significant burn that you have to take care of. Right. Fractures because of the, the big muscle contractions, uh, facial drooping, head injury. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of things there, ringing of the ears. Uh, dysrhythmias, cardiac dysrhythmias, make sure that you're prepared for, for CPR with the lightning strike. Who was that? was uh, Lee Trevino. 
You know who Lee Javino is? Old Hispanic golfer, good golfer. He's old. Yeah, he, I think he's been struck like three times by lightning. Golfing. Big metal rod, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, uh, the, the other things that uh, we'll look at right quick are altitude sickness. A lot of these have to do with uh, the peop people going up into altitude and not acclimating themselves. They go up in altitude too fast and don't acclimate themselves. On all these, the common response is if they start having the difficulties, okay, they, the patient needs to descend. All right. Uh, I knew a group that went to, uh, where did they go? Where's that big, huge mountain? Uh, in South America. Little, little kind of Peru. Went to this huge mountain region in Peru. A lady died from it. She got CHF, and we weren't too sure on the cases. She was, she was pretty old anyway, but she needed to descend. She needed oxygen and descend. Uh, and they, they didn't get her down fast enough. But there is, once you go up there, uh, either you go up too fast or you go up without acclimating, it, it, it is important you can get very sick. There's a lot of signs and symptoms, okay, that are very common with, with all of these, okay? Uh, you start feeling bad, respiratory distress, headaches, nausea, vomiting, right? And it just depends, you know, you, ha you have these different types, like uh, mountain sickness. You have things with that sickness that will be with, cause pulmonary uh, <coughs> edema, cerebral edema, right? And they all have the very common things that they need to come down in altitude and they need to be oxygenated and, and transported, okay? And they surely, in, in, on all these, they start showing these signs and symptoms. They don't need to go any higher. So you're going up this mountain, perhaps, and, and some of these take days to get up, right? Just, they're just not backpacking up there. They're traveling, but it takes days to get up there. If they start having these signs and symptoms, don't keep going. They need to go, not up, they need to go back down, okay? But uh, again, like a lot of these, these are geographic type things. Okay, so if you were to work in the, the mountains of, you know, the uh, real high elevation, I don't know where that would be around here, but uh, nowhere around here. But uh, if you were to get into these elevations, then that's something that you would have to specialize on. Again, the same, same uh, signs and symptoms, okay? They're very common signs and symptoms together, together okay? No matter what takes place, all right, the mountain sickness. This is important to note that the SpO2 is 90 percent is normal at high altitudes. The SpO2 will drop. It, it's not that the it's less oxygen percentage, right? If you go up to 6,000 feet, what's the ox oxygen percentage? Square meter oxygen at 6,000 feet. Percent of oxygen is the same. The percent of oxygen is still 21 percent. What happens is you're going up in elevation, okay, and the oxygen molecules are getting further apart because of the decrease in pressure. When we do diving emergencies, it's opposite. There's greater pressure. But as you go up the mountain, there's less pressure, okay, and atmospheric pressure so oxygen molecules are further apart. So essentially you're sitting there going, <laughs> trying to breathe, you get short of breath because the, the molecules are further apart, okay? Uh, so that's where you get the shortness of breath. At 10,000 feet, you still have 21% oxygen, okay? Just trivia. But to keep in mind, the percentages go down, okay? So this is the, what? How would you say that? Ape? 
Anyway, half tube pulmonary edema. Looks like a lot like CHF, okay? And, uh, but these guys need to descend in uh, altitude, oxygenate them, descend them in the altitude. There's the, the rails are wrong guy. Uh, okay, and then the last one I believe is the high cerebral edema. The fluid in the head starts to swell. Same thing, a little bit more serious because it involves the, the head and the brain. But coordination, off the mental status, seizures, right? And again, descend, lower the altitude, get in the lower altitude, okay? Read through these, make sure that you're familiar with the definitions, what they are. Uh, questions? Everybody good? Uh, then.